We here at Habits by Republica had the privilege to witness a conversation with Dr. Gabor Mate, one of the great thinkers of our time. Our friend, Romanian psychotherapist Gabriele Cicu, invited Dr. Mate to take part in a dialogue about generational trauma, new ways of healing, modern stress, and about what is normal. In the next few minutes, we have the pleasure to present you the biggest conclusions and lessons we've learned from their conversation. Enjoy. Hello, Gabor. Uh, welcome to this conversation. Let me tell to our friends and uh, that we didn't see each other face to face for three years now. So I'm very happy and anxious to have this conversation with you. I'd like to start with a little context. We first met back in 2018, and at that time you invited me to a very special program in the uh, Amazonian rainforest. So I have to confess that it was a very powerful and life-changing program for me. That was in 2019, um, and that was in the Amazon jungle in Peru. And it was at a place called the Temple of the Way of Light, which is a facility where they do ceremonies with indigenous native healers from the Shipibo uh, nation, one of the indigenous people in Peru. And the ceremonies were with this plant called ayahuasca, which is really two plants mixed together. It's a brew that you drink and it can give you some very powerful, sometimes beautiful, sometimes terrifying, but always very instructive and deep experiences. And I was going to lead that retreat, and you were there uh, along with 23 other colleagues from all over the world, all health professionals, uh, doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, um, uh, counselors, and so on. And I was going to lead this. And as you know, we had the first ceremony where the, we worked, I worked with your group, your group for one day. That evening, there was the ceremony. There were six shamans. There were 24 of us in the Malacca, which is the building where the ceremony is held. Each of the maestros and the maestras came to each of us one time to chant to us. So each of us participants had six chants directed at us. And then any one time in the Malacca, there were six chants going on at the same time. And his chants are, of course, are very mystical and very beautiful. I didn't have any kind of a deep experience. And I often don't, even though I lead these retreats. My own experiences are often somewhat distant. So these shamans sent a delegation to me next morning, and they said, we can't work with you in a ceremony because you are filled with too much dark energy and that affects our chanting and it affects how we work with other people. So basically they fired me from my own retreat. People had paid all this money to come from all over the world to work with me and all of a sudden they're telling me I can't do it. What they did is they offered me to have private ceremonies every second night while you guys the rest of you the other five of them one of the six was going to work with me the other five was going to work with the rest of you guys what what they said was the problem was that no they didn't know who i was they don't they know my name i mean they may know my name but that's all they knew they didn't know <laughs> doctor internationally respected author and speaker and all the stuff they also didn't know about my childhood which is of being a jewish infant under the Nazis in Budapest in 1944. But here's what they said. They said, we sense that you've worked with so much trauma in your life, so many traumatized people, and you've absorbed their traumas and stresses, and you haven't cleared it out of yourself. That's why your energy is so dark. And they also said that we think that when you were very small, you had a big scare, and you haven't got over it yet. They knew nothing about me. And it was true. It was totally true. So 
I isolated myself. I stayed on my own. I did yoga. I did meditation. I walked in the rainforest. And every second night, I had a ceremony. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of what happened for me, except to say that on the fifth ceremony, I had a huge experience. A huge experience. Just opened me right up. And I write about this in my new book, by the way, uh, this whole experience. What they also said to me afterwards is that when they heard that a group of healthcare providers, doctors and so on are coming, they thought they'd have an easy job because they said to, uh, they said to me, we work with traumatized people all the time and we absorb their energies, but we cleared out of ourselves. And we thought you medical people will do the same thing. But no, they said, you came here. We've never met to such a heavy, dark bunch. I remember that. They, they told us, they, they asked us how, how, we, how you can cure and help people when you have so much darkness in yourself. Exactly. So that's what they picked up about me. And that's what they picked up about the, the rest of you as well. That's where we met. That was the yeah, contact. Exactly. But that's a, after, after that, for me and for you, for sure, because I, I hear you speaking about, the, uh, about that after that, it's, it, it's a, a very uh, powerful change in, 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 in the paradigm, in, 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 the, in, the, you know, in the health paradigm, can I say? Because I you know I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a psychoanalyst, but I, I've never speak before in, the, in terms of healing, you know, we, 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 we used to term, you are a medical doctor of also, and you, you, we used to use the term cure, you know, diagnostic, we have a diagnostic, we have a treatment, we have a cure. But this for me, it was a very powerful changing in the paradigm in, in, in terms of terms of healing. Actually, I would say that in the psychiatric realm, they don't even talk about cure. They don't talk about healing at all, but they don't even talk about cure because they have no idea how to cure depression or, or, or bipolar illness or ADHD or, or psychosis. They can control the symptoms is what they can do. So they're not even talking about cure so much as symptom control. Healing is not even on their radar. That's in my new book. I talk a lot about the whole psychiatric paradigm of, even, even the concept mental disease, you have to understand. It's only one way of talking about a phenomenon. So there's the phenomenon. And we put the etiquette. Yeah. There's the actual experience that people have of low mood or suicidality or hallucinations or voices. Or pain. Or emotional pain or, or dissociation. There's the experience that people have. Then there's the diagnosis of mental illness. That's only one way of looking at that experience. And we being doctors, we want to fit everything into a medical paradigm, as you say. Exactly. There's other ways of looking at it. The, the other way to look, for example, um, I have been diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And one of my books is on that subject. I know it's been published in Romania. So yeah. people say, I have ADHD, attention deficit, I have it. But is that, is that true, that language? Think about it. Mm -hmm. I have a cell phone. I can put down the cell phone. I can pick up the cell phone. I can throw it away. It's a thing that's separate from me. When I say I have ADHD or I have depression, is that a thing separate from me? Or is that a process that's happening inside me? Obviously, it's not a thing that's separate that somehow entered me. It's, it's a process inside me. How did that process arise inside me? That arose because of my life, of what happened to me as a small child, what happened, what, what kind of life I've led as an adult. Now, most psychiatrists don't understand that. They think of these things as things that people have. But they don't know how to ask many questions about the kind of life that person has had that maybe will explain why that process is active inside them.
Now, if you start asking, how did this process arise inside you? And you have to look at people's lives, maybe then you can help people heal. Maybe it can, it can help people um, address that process in a positive, active, um, in, intuitive way. That's very different from here's a pill, take this and call me in two weeks. And by the way, I have nothing against pills, but they don't deal with the underlying process. They just su suppress the symptoms. When you talk about process, no, uh, the, in fact, there are feelings. No, there are, there are our feelings that we feel. We have we feel sadness. We feel happiness. Uh, we 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 used to you, we used to put these these feelings in two boxes. You know, uh, negative feelings and uh, positive feelings. And uh, negative feelings, we have to, you know, to give some medication or just throw away, you know? No, if they are not good. Yeah. What you said, what, what, I, what we learned in the, in the, in the Shipibo people, that they are, what, what you said about that? Well, you know, when I talk about process, I may be talking about feelings, but I'm not necessarily talking about feelings because sometimes, okay. The problem is people don't even know what they feel. <laughs> That's okay. Like, like feeling is something that you feel that you're aware of. But a lot of people, for example, had a lot of anger, but they don't feel the anger. Why don't they feel the anger? Because as children, they were not allowed to. So they had to push it down, repress it, push it down so much, they don't even know they're angry. By the way, what is the word when we push something down? What do we call that? We call that in English, depressing. Dep to depress something is to push it down. Mm -hmm. So you got in depression is not a feeling of anger, but just a, a mood that's alienated and bored and, 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 and kind of, it's painful, but you're not even feeling the real feeling. Okay. So, so, so how, how we get to feel the feeling? That's where professional help comes in. But um, okay. you do it, no, first of all, the feelings tend to show up in a, in, in a way in people's lives, but they don't know what the feelings are about. So very often people might feel anger because of the bus was five minutes late. And they don't know what that they're really feeling is their hurt and disappointment as a child that their needs were not met. But all of a sudden, you know, uh, the bus was late. This is terrible. You know, we have to, you know. No, it's about what happened to you as a kid. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that the feelings sometimes show up sideways. They show up unexpectedly, and then sometimes you have to really talk to people and ask them about their childhoods and what happened to them, and 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 then the feelings. If people feel safe, see the reason the feelings were suppressed in the first place. In, at age two or three is because it wasn't safe to feel them. Because mm -hmm. if I get angry, mommy won't like me. Mm -hmm. And I can't have mommy not like me because then I don't survive. So I'm going to push them, not consciously, unconsciously, I'm going to push them my feelings. Because I, I didn't feel safe. Now, if, if they come and talk to you or me or, or, or anybody and they feel safe, now that's safety gives them permission to feel whatever is there. Mm -hmm. So what people need need for to be fully in touch with their feelings, they need safety, emotional safety. How you can describe safeness in this moment of the world? You know, in this moment of the how, how you call it? We, we we know that in our office of the of psychotherapy, you know, we, we know the co the name and the what what this concept of safeness it is yeah. but what is safeness in nowadays well look there was never absolute safety in the world i mean um at any time you could be hit by a lightning uh, killed by an earthquake uh hit by a bus you know so there's no absolute there's no absolute safety okay and in some places in the world like eastern europe where we are like we're seeing right now again there's all kinds of historical danger you know 
whether you're Romanian or Hungarian or Serb or Croat or Ukrainian or Russian, um, Pole, Czech, you know, I mean, there's just always so much turmoil going on. But when I talk about safety, I don't mean an absolute safety. I mean, I come to your office and I sense that you're gonna accept me, you're not gonna judge me, you're not gonna reject me, you're gonna be curious about me, you're gonna have some compassion for me, you're here to, you're here to help me. So safety is not just the absence of a threat, it's also the presence of contact. So, okay. so when I'm talking about safety in this sense, I'm talking about that contact. That's, that's another big question for you that I have, I have in my mind. How, what, what, what's, the con what's the humanism in these days? What's the contact of the people in, in these days? Because what, what, we feel, what I feel in, in, in the rainforest, that's what it was very healing for me, the feel of contact with others, with nature. I, I, I knew it before, you know, rationally. But I, I didn't feel, you know, you know what I mean. But wh how, how is, what, what's the contact now? Well, so here's the thing. This is where you have to look at human nature. Um, so how, how we evolved as human beings was millions of years of contact with people very close to us. Small band hunter-gatherers. Everybody was together. Selfishness was unknown because it threatened the whole tribe. It was all about what we can do for the whole unit, support each other, uh, look after each other, give to each other. And if you look at traditional cultures, they do a lot of giving. They don't do a lot of demanding and competition with each other. They do a lot of giving. That's their culture. That's because that's how we evolved. So basically today we have a culture that was very much against human nature. Now human nature exists, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be realized. For example, if I had a, you know what an acorn is? An acorn? Mm -hmm. the acorn is, now what's the nature of the acorn? What, what is the acorn supposed to become? supposed to become an oak tree. You plant, the, you plant the acorn in the ground, it's gonna grow up to be a big oak tree. So that's the nature of the acorn is to become an oak tree. But what happens if you put the acorn on my desk? Is it gonna become an oak tree? No. No, why not? Because even though it's its nature, that nature needs the right conditions in order to develop. The same thing with human beings. We have a certain nature, but you put us in an environment that doesn't support that nature, we're going to become distorted. We're going to become not like we're meant to be. And modern civilization, not just modern civilization, but civilization, the more and more we got away from nature, the more we, more we got away from our own human nature. And that's what we have right now. So then, there you are in the rainforest with Aboriginal people who have been living this life for thousands of years. And they are in connection. Yeah, and you're in a, who know nature, who know every plant, who speak to every flower, who, who know how to use every root and every leaf in some medicinal or nutritional way. They're completely, in, who listen to the trees. They're totally in contact with nature and they're guiding you. And you're in this amazing environment in other nature, and um, you are with other people on the same quest. Now you're back where you're supposed to be in the first place. Naturally, you come alive. Naturally, you feel connected. Naturally, you feel more yourself than you ever have before. Yeah, Gabor, but you know, we live in the big cities. We don't have the power of Curandero around us. We, we, we don't have even a tree, maybe one kilometer by us. Yeah, that's true. So, and obviously we cannot go back to that way of life. I mean, that's gone. But let me ask you a question. 
as I'm sitting here on my chair speaking with you, are you worried that I'm going to float off to the ceiling, that I'm going to start flying? Are you worried about that? Why don't I start floating up to the ceiling like a leaf or like a feather? Why not? I don't know. You don't know? Have you heard about <laughs> gravity? Yeah. Okay, it's my idea because of <laughs> That's why I want to start floating because this gravity keeps me here. Okay, now, but let me ask you this question. What if I was sent to the moon? What would happen to me there? I would, start, I would start floating. Yeah. Why? Because the gravity on the moon is not the same as that on Earth. So what do people do when they go to the moon? How do they stay not floating? How do they stay grounded? They wear heavy boots and heavy clothing, right? Because we know that the gravitational force on the moon is much less than that on the earth. So we can compensate for it, right? Now, a modern society has lost a lot of things. We've also gained a lot of things, but in gaining a lot of things, we've lost a lot of things. Now, if we're aware of it, then we can compensate for it. So there might not be a tree within a mile of you, but for God's sakes, your country is full of mountains and forests and valleys and lakes and beautiful places. Take children out there regularly. Human beings should go out there regularly. You know, in your city, Bucharest, these monstrous, huge uh, buildings that Ceausescu yeah. yeah. built, well, tear them down and put up forests. <laughs> or, or, or do something you know <clears throat> because um those houses those those large buildings they're meant to make you feel very small as a human being but, but not small as a human being as compared to nature because we're a part of nature so if we recognize that we're part of nature then we don't feel small but those buildings were meant to make you feel small as compared to the leader, as compared to the authority, you know? So if we know these things, let's build cities where our knowledge is expressed. So it's not a question of um, having to go back to some old way of life that's impossible, but of if I'm going to go to the moon, I need to know what conditions I'm going to face there and I need to compensate for it. In the same way, if we're gonna live in modern civilization, we need to know what we've lost, and we need to compensate for it. I mean, and if we're conscious, we can do it. If we're not conscious, we can't do it. So first of all, is to be conscious. You have to be conscious of, 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 of what we need and what we've lost, yes. You said that you make um, meditation, you made, uh, so that's this kind of things helps. Everybody needs to find something, you know, actually, I get more out of swimming than I get out of meditation. Okay. But, but when I'm swimming, I take deep breaths, I blow out, and I do this for 50 minutes. Uh, that for me is a kind of calming and meditative process. I come out of the pool feeling very different than I when I'm in it. For some people, it's meditation, yoga, nature walks prayers, singing, chanting, making music, creating, creating art, um, walking, I mean, whatever it is, you know?